So at 6.30 a.m. local Israeli time, the Hamas launched attacks on a number of cities, villages, and military outposts by the Israeli Defense Forces, killing civilians, women, children, men, taking hostages, killing soldiers, taking over whole bases around the border with Gaza. At the same time, Hamas fired 2,000 rockets within the span of 24 hours into Israeli city centers, including Tel Aviv, killing civilians, damaging buildings. And to this point, 24 hours later, this is still a developing story. We have about 300 dead confirmed on the Israeli side, about 2,000 injured, and 100 kidnapped civilians and soldiers into the Palestinian side of Gaza. And at this point, it's unknown where they are, but theories are saying that they're within the tunnel system of Gaza, which would make any ground operations by Israel in Gaza very, very complex. More about that in a second. Now, the Israel response at this point has been very, very slow, and that's the weird part about it. Starting from the point of entry that was absolutely overran, all the way to about four or five hours from the initial response to this whole event, we had people basically running around and running over cities and bases, and there was no military response for four to five hours. Absolute death. No response. Everything was paralyzed. Why? I don't know. Now, to this point, the Israeli response, about 24 hours into it, is still based on the previous cycles of violence, which is basically bombing empty buildings and not doing a lot. All strictly from the air, no ground forces on the ground yet, just aerial strikes into empty buildings. Now, of course, there's 250 dead on the Palestinian side, but that's one of the world's most dense populated areas. We're never going to be bombarding even empty buildings. People are going to get hurt. We have 250 dead, 1,800 injured, according to Palestinian sources, the credibility of which is for you to decide. Now, so what happened here really, beyond the mainstream media and BS that you hear on CNN and Fox and all the rest of them? Well, the story here is much more complex than the age-old, Israel versus the Palestinian conflict, which I'm not going to get into in this video because this is going to be a battleground for people to beef over history. That's not a point in this video. I want to talk about facts and what's happening right now on the ground. Now, like what it seems like on mainstream media, the Palestinians don't live in one single entity. In fact, there's two separate Palestinians. One is controlled by the Hamas, which is Gaza. The other one is controlled by the Palestinian Authority, which is basically a descendant of the PLO, and that controls the West Bank. Now, both of them chose completely different approaches to this whole conflict. On the one hand, the Palestinian Authority is trying to shame Israel in diplomatic avenues, basically going to the UN and going to the, all these avenues to get Israel to back down and work through a diplomatic solution to allow them to have better borders. On the other hand, Hamas is going on all-out war trying to destroy Israel not forsaking the way of violence. Now, these two approaches birth absolutely different situations. On the one hand, the West Bank is prosperous. They have a stock exchange, they have nightclubs, restaurants. Life in the West Bank is quasi-normal, at least for the most part, and definitely way better than what's going on in Gaza. Gaza is basically a refugee camp that's out of control. People are starving, it's dirt poor, there's no resources, no infrastructure, it's absolutely chaotic. Now. I'm not here to play the blame game. I'm just giving you the situation on the ground. People in the West Bank have a decent life, somewhat. People in Gaza have a horrible life. Now, while the PLO dropped out of this violence route, for the most part, Hamas stayed in. And about 10 years ago, they had a beef with the Iranians, but they figured out a way to make friends. On the face of it, Hamas and the Iranians should never get along. You see, the Iranians are Shiites, and Hamas are Sunnis. They really hate each other. And when I say really, I mean really. Now, the crazy part is that as much as they hate each other, they both hate Israel more, and that's why about 10 years ago they made a pact to work together to destroy Israel. Now, effectively, what happened is that Hamas became a proxy for the Iranians, much like the Hezbollah up in the north of Israel and Lebanon, and much like the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Iranians love to operate via these proxies, and Hamas basically taking the money of Iran became such proxy. But the real question here is why now? If Iran was running Hamas for over a decade, why launch this offensive now? What triggered this? Now, on the face of it, and what you see in mainstream media, is that this was the 50th anniversary of the 1973 October War, as it's called on the Arab side, and the Yom Kippur War, as it's called on the Israeli side. 
a war in which Israel was attacked by multiple fronts and still beat the living crap out of these countries, which is a huge embarrassment. And them basically doing it on the 50th anniversary was some sort of an amends, you know, to fix the shame of the 1973 defeat. The other reasons that were given is encroachments by the Israeli side on the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which number one is not a new thing. It keeps happening all the time. You have militants basically throwing rocks and shooting at Israeli soldiers. They chase them. They walk into the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Israeli police chases them into Al-Aqsa Mosque. And then, you know, the whole festival starts about how Israel is encroaching on Al-Aqsa Mosque. I'm not here to take sides. I'm just describing why this isn't news. This has been happening for a while. And Israel has no plans to demolish the Al-Aqsa Mosque, nor to rebuild their own temple on that mountain, which is a whole different story that the Palestinians are selling that narrative. Absolute nonsense. They're also talking about, you know, their own agenda and how they've been imprisoned for so long and they, they actually have, you know, finally blew up. All this may be true. They might actually got to a boiling point because of their relationship with Israel. They might be annoyed more now by the Al-Aqsa Mosque encroachments. They might be more mad right now because of the 50th anniversary of the 1973 Yom Kippur slash October War. All this may be true, but those are not the predominant reasons why now. The reason why now actually has to do with a country far, far away, and it's not the United States. It is the Saudi Arabians. Why Saudi Arabia? Well, you see, uh, the Saudis are the most important Arab nation in the world. Sorry, all Arab nations, they are. They have the most amounts of influence, money, oil, policymaking, whatever the Saudi says goes. They control OPEC, they control the Arabic narrative. And the one enemy that they have in the world is actually Iran. Iranians hate the Saudis and they've been very active at trying to hurt Saudi Arabia as much as they can, including a drone strike on Aramco, which is the Saudi company, by the Houthi rebels, which is a proxy of Iran, just a little while ago. So the Iranians, they hate the Saudis. The Saudis, they hate the Iranians. There's tensions there. There's a lot of distrust. There's a lot of fear. And the Saudis are now looking at Iran racing towards a nuclear bomb. By the way, shout out to this administration for allowing this to happen, which is an absolute insanity. But nevertheless, this is the reality. You can't sugarcoat it. So while the Iranians are basically racing to a nuclear bomb on behalf of the guidance of the U.S. government. Thank you, President Biden, for that. The Saudis are like, oh, my God, we have to have a nuke of our own. This can't happen. And basically, they went to the United States and said, well, look, guys, we need a nuke of our own. If you're giving it to the to Iranians, give us our blessing as well. We want a nuke just so we can counter these guys. They want to kill us. And the United States basically said, you know what? Cool. But here are the conditions for us to do this. Number one, stop the shenanigans with OPEC. Give us cheap oil. Number two, we can't give you a nuke until you guys agree not to bomb the freaking state of Israel with that nuke we're going to give you. So that means you have to make peace with Israel and normalize a relationship. And that means that if you do it, the rest of the Arab world, with the exception of Iran and the Palestinians, will follow your lead because you're the most important Saudi. It is what it is. Now, the Saudis don't really have any beef with Israel and they have no issues with controlling OPEC. So they basically said, bet, let's do it. Now, the first thing that happened to lead into this is the Saudis never wanted to be first, so they let the United Arab Emirates sign the peace accords, the normalization accords first. So once the UAE signed this deal, once the other Arab nations signed this deal, Saudi was next. And you have to think about it like a three-way NBA trade. Every single team gets something it wants. The United States gets cheap oil for life. Israel gets normalization with the Arab world. Massive. Saudis get a nuke to counter Iran. Everybody wins in this trade. Everyone except Iran and the Palestinians. You see, for the Palestinians and the Iranians, this cannot happen. And mainly the Iranians, because the Iranians are pushing their own little triangle. They're trying to broker a triangle with China, Iran, and Saudi to counter the U.S. proposal of U.S., Israel, and Saudi. And they're offered a lot of carrots to Saudis to go that route. But if the Saudis will buy that deal with the United States and Israel, the Chinese Iranian Saudi triangle is rest and peace. It's dead. They can't have it. It's a zero sum game. Somebody wins, somebody loses. And the losers in this agreement would be the Iranians. So, right when this deal was supposed to be signed, on the brink of its signature, you have massive rocket attacks. Saturday, six in the morning, everybody's asleep, everybody's home, minimal military presence, border collapses, cities, bases overrun, absolute chaos. 
Now, there's a lot of questions on the Israeli side. How the hell did these people get in? How do we have three, four hundred people just literally cross through the border like it was nothing? Israel invested billions of dollars in this system on defense to prevent exactly this from happening, and it failed. So how did it happen? Did it undergo a huge cybersecurity attack? Did it have a drone strike against it, basically eliminating the entire border? Was it a huge colossal failure and negligence? Whatever the case may be, I don't know. But there's one thing I can tell you. The offensive was extremely coordinated, well-planned, well-funded, well-executed, and absolutely greenlit by Iran against Israel via the proxy of Hamas. There's no doubt about it. But you see, the thing is that once these horrific images, which I mentioned in the beginning of the video, hit Israeli media, the Israeli public is going to ask for a massive response. There's no two ways about it. This was a colossal failure for the Israeli intelligence, for the Israeli military, and a failure of epic proportions that was almost as bad, or maybe even worse, than the 1973 Yom Kippur intelligence failure. And yes, even though Israel did win that war, that was another massive intelligence failure. This probably was even bigger, or at least as big. So Israel is currently in a catch-22 of sorts. On the one hand, if they go out and they demolish Gaza, they're basically jeopardizing the agreement with the Saudis, which is historically important for the United States and Israel. Plus, you have 100 hostages on the ground in Gaza, plus the insane complexity of fighting in a highly dense residential area, massive casualties for the Israeli military, the hostages will be dead, the Saudi deal will be dead, absolute chaos. On the flip side, if you don't go to war for this and just bombard it from the air for a couple of days and let it go, you basically lose this war, but you get to keep the Saudi deal. But here's the crazy part. Once you get shamed like this, not sure that the Saudis even want to sign this deal with a weak Israel. Plus, you're going to be inviting as Israel many, many future attacks on you if you are perceived to be weak. You see, Israel is living in a prison mentality. They're surrounded by people that want to kill it, much like in the prison violence, right? If they show weakness in that neighborhood that they live in, they're going to get overrun by much, much worse than what we've seen in the past two days. So whatever the choice they make, it's an impossible choice. There's no good choices here. And by the way, the United States with the Biden administration will be pushing towards option number two, which is save the Saudi agreement. The Israeli public is going to push to option number one. Short term, BB Netanyahu, this prime minister of Israel that everybody keeps talking about, he has a huge win on his hands because right now, the whole colossal clusterfuck that happened in Israel, all these protests, the legal reforms, all this opposition, his unpopularity, that's all gone. Everybody's now united behind him to go to war. But once the dust settles and there will be investigations and it will be actually looked at who was at fault here, he's going to have a major disgrace on his hands and he will be ousted. So long term, huge loss for Bibi. Short term, it's a win. He gets to survive. But I'm not looking out for Bibi in a couple of years. He's going to be out of the job. The problem is that Israel has another dilemma which is the absolute northern front of Israel. Right now, what you're looking at is the southern front. On the northern part of Israel, you got Hezbollah, which is the Lebanese organization completely funded and operated by the Iranians. And the Hezbollah are sitting on an arsenal of 130,000 precision rockets that can hit every point in Israel for days and days and weeks and weeks. And there's no Iron Dome that can stop 130,000 rockets. I mean, 100%. It's going to cause massive effect, massive damage. Now, why is the Israeli response been so slow at this point? Well, some of it has to do with the fact that the fighting is still going on inside Israel. Until the Israeli army clears out the last of these Hamas terrorists from its grounds, it's not going to commence any operations in Gaza. Number two, you have the hostages on the ground, about 100 people. You have to evaluate what you want to do with these guys. Number three, the ground offensive requires a prep about 48 to 72 hours. You have to call out reserves. You have to work out a plan that has to take time. Plus, you have Hezbollah dilemma, right? If you launch a ground offensive in Gaza, what happens if Hezbollah joins the fight, right? They got a massive arsenal, but they depend on the Iranian trigger. And here's the crazy part. While Hamas shot a few mortars, you know, the past few hours, if Hezbollah joins the fight, you're going to know about it. It's not going to be just a couple of mortars. But here's the thing. Hezbollah will not join this fight without the pre-approval and the guidance of Iran. It's not going to happen. And the Iranians will have to make a decision here. If they pull the trigger on Hezbollah, they lose leverage. And I'll explain. Hezbollah was armed to the thief by Iran as a quasi 
balance of terror against Israel. Should Israel preemptively attack Iran and try to prevent it from getting to a nuclear weaponry, then Hezbollah will act and basically deploy its 130,000 missiles towards the entirety of Israel. That's a balance of terror, right? If you pull the trigger right now and you activate Hezbollah to help Hamas, you lose that leverage because once Hezbollah pulls and blows its load, Iran does not have that leverage anymore. So they have to make a decision whether they want to keep Hezbollah basically on point, still ready if Israel actually acts upon their threats against Iran, or they want to launch them right now, but it's a one shot. Once you launch them, Israel is going to react in such a way that Hezbollah will not be recognizable. Yes, Israel will have massive casualties, but it's not going to leave Hezbollah in its current configuration, much like it won't leave Gaza in its current configuration, should it choose to do so based on recent events. Whatever the case may be, the next 24 to 48 hours will be extremely critical for the entire future of the Middle East. Make no mistake about it. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe on your way out. I'll see you in the next video.